Closing the doors, guys. Walking. I'll set up the network for I mean, nothing with log logs. I'm going to move to Trump because I've been doing this. Oh, yeah, yeah, what's well, here? Okay. This is all complete. We'll be ready to go at two. Let's take a picture of the audience. <laughs> <laughs> Is the time right? I think we start in a minute or so. Uh, Nobel Symposium on Social Networks and the Roundtable Discussions on uh, the Future of Network Analysis. Today we are at the beautiful historical museum Kulturen in the very heart of Lund. And the wallpaper you can see behind me is actually from the late 17th century. My name is Tommy Anderson and I'm a professor in economics here at Lund University. And I've organized this Nobel Symposium together with Christopher Edling, a professor in sociology here at Lund University. The symposium has also been organized in cooperation with the Royal Swedish Academy of Sciences and Lund University School of Economics and Management. The aim of this symposium is to bring together internationally leading scientists from social sciences and beyond, including political science, sociology, computer science, physics, epidemiology, health sciences, and many, many other subjects to assess the core contribution and identify the most pressing research questions. It is now time to summarize and discuss what we have learned here in the last two days. What did we learn and what is the future of social network analysis? I will shortly leave the word to Matt Jackson, a professor in economics at Stanford University, who will introduce the panel and lead the discussions here today. I hope you will find these discussions interesting. So thank you so much for joining us here today. And I look very much forward to the next hour. So Matt, I leave the word to you. Thank you very much, Tommy. Tommy and Christopher for organizing this and putting together this incredible panel. So let me start by introducing our panelists. So we start with Kathleen Carley, who's for, um, studying organizations, networks and organizations. We have David Lazar, who's studying networks and political science. We have Vittoria Coliza, who's studying epidemiology and networks and how they <laughs> spread. We have Duncan Watts who's been studying networks and sociology. We have Laszlo Barabasi, who's been studying networks from a physics and uh, physical law perspective. So we have an incredible diversity of areas. I think that you can see the uniqueness in networks and networks across disciplines and being useful in many different arenas. And we might start by just 
defining what do we mean by networks in our different disciplines. And we can start with Kathleen. So when I look at networks, it's the nodes and the links between them. Those nodes might be people, they might be words, they might be organizations as a whole, or they might be tasks. And the, the, the thing is that the nodes and the links co-evolve and they change through time. They're affected by the space they're in and they're affected by technology. What she said. <laughs> yeah. I mean, just generally, I, I, I think that the core element of networks is things are connected and those things could be a bunch of different possibilities and that connectivity is consequential in some ways for the system at the collective level or for, uh, for the entities or people who are in the network, that it matters where in the network you are. And in the context of infectious disease epidemiology, where networks emerge because if we're thinking about a directly transmitted disease, for example, a disease that can be transmitted from human to human, networks are really the con represent the context along which the disease can be transmitted. So if we're thinking about something like COVID-19 or influenza, we look at networks which are uh, respiratory contacts, physical contacts, face-to-face -face contacts, so co-location in the same room, that is where, for example, the disease can happen. If we're talking about sexually transmitted infection, instead of looking at sexual contacts. And what looks emerge also, if we look, for example, at invasion, so spatial invasion of the disease throughout the world. Imagine the start of the COVID-19 pandemic from China to the rest of the world. That invasion was brought by infected uh, passengers. So they brought the infection from the sea area to not yet affected areas. So we have networks there as well. These are transportation networks, mobility networks, connecting different areas. And of course, all of them are based on behavioral behavior. Oh, right. So from a, you know, from a sociological perspective, I think, you know, the, the idea of a network starts from the observation that, you know, almost nothing in life is, uh, is done uh, on our own. Like everything we do uh, is uh, sort of embedded in some kind of community or in your family or in your organization. Uh, and so your behavior is affected by what other people are doing and the things that you, uh, that you try to affect uh, are in turn sort of mitigated or or, uh, or amplified by, by other people in, in your network. So uh, the you know, sort of fundamental, any kind of fundamental question about why people do what they do or how to make them do uh, something different uh, is going to, in some way or another, run into this notion of, of a network that, that connects us all. I arrived to networks from the perspective of complexity and trying to understand how systems around that work. So if you think about life, the very existence of life is really not about genes and molecules, but about the interactions between them. So we will not be able to understand life and disease without kind of mapping out the network between the components. The same comes when it comes to consciousness, right? It's kind of carried by a very complicated, very dense neural network that is within our brain. And, and we must map out and understand the underlying network to get to the mechanistic role of how consciousness emerges. And even if we go to economics and we think about the market and we look at economic processes, really those are the results of many interactions between many different players. So fundamentally, for understand complexity and complex systems around us, the first step is that we need to understand what are the components and what are the interactions between them. In other words, we need to understand the networks behind them. Yeah. And I, I guess to, to put it in an economic perspective, these actors can be very different entities. They could be people who are sharing information. They could be banks that are uh, sharing partnerships and investments. They could be countries that have trade alliances. And so all of these things matter. And I guess one question that we can go around and, and talk a little bit about is, given the diversity of different applications, there are things that we've still learned about network structures and how they impact behaviors in these different arenas. And it might be useful to start by just saying a little bit about what have we learned, what kinds of things can we think of as, as major insights. Just give an example of, of some kind of insight that we've learned from networks about the behaviors in these different areas that we wouldn't have learned if we didn't take into account the network structures. Maybe Duncan, you want to start? Yeah, I mean, I think, uh, you know, if you take, you know, either a network of, of, of people or, uh, or a network of banks, 
uh, you know, you can ask questions about, uh, you know, the, the sort of the stability of those systems or their propensity to change. Uh, and so if you were, uh, you know, some kind of external agent who, uh, who wanted to, you know, get your idea to spread throughout uh, a village or a population, or you were uh, some kind of regulator who wanted to do the opposite and stop some sort of contagion from spreading uh, throughout a network of banks, uh, you know, something that you would need to pay attention to is how all of these different, um, uh, you know, in, in addition to the sort of obvious stuff about like, well, you know, each individual has their own kind of propensity to be interested in something or the banks take their own propensity to fail. The interaction can really important because of all of the influences that are happening between the nodes in this network. So uh, any kind of targeting strategy or any kind of uh, you know, inoculation strategy is going to is, is likely going to be sensitive to the to the structure of the network, and I think that you know different flavors of that sort of general class of applications come up all the time. Um, you know, in marketing and in, in uh, you know in regulation and in epidemiology and, and lots of other uh, important uh, policy relevant applications. Well, you want to say? I mean, I, I, you've done a lot of work on the asymmetries in networks in terms of the connections. And do you want to say a little bit about, sure. say, the role of hubs and, and how sure. that might elucidate the kinds of things that Duncan was just talking about? Absolutely. For me, kind of one of the, the, the biggest surprise of network science in the last 25 years is that we just talked about how many different networks we think around the table, and there are many others. And despite the diversity of the nodes and the links, sometimes the nodes are people, sometimes they are cells, sometimes they are molecules, sometimes they are neurons, and the links are also very different, there are some fundamental organizing principles that control this and, and shape the structure of these networks. So in some way, man, many of these networks, once you get rid of the labels, are more similar than different from each other. This is not to say there are no differences between the social network and the self, but there are some fundamental commonalities. And that's why we can actually sit around the table because we can borrow tools from each other. And let me be very specific, right? So, you know, Duncan has brought to forward actually the idea of small world mass kind of across many systems. My lab has actually shown the role of the hubs uh, uh, in these systems, how in many, many different networks from the cell to the uh, to social systems, a few large hubs naturally emerge, and once they are there, they determine the network robustness, its response to failures, uh, its response to attacks, the spreading processes, and so on. And these are fundamental laws that are independent whether you look at the biological network, or you look at the economic network, or you look at the social network. And the way I think about it, it's a little bit, these are similar to Newton's laws, right? Is that Newton's law govern all mechanical processes, and there's lots of other things taking place in a system, in a car, and so on, but those laws are unmutable, and they're applying across many, many different systems. You know, gravity controls why something falls down the ground, but also why the moon rotates the way it does around the Earth, and why the sea level goes up and down. And what we're finding in networks is that there are a couple of, a handful of principles that really cut across networks. And you need to understand that to really kind of build on that and build applications and, and, and to really understand the essence of the system. So this has been really the biggest revelation for me in the last 20, 25 years that these rules do exist. And these rules and these laws create a common language among us. So it allows me to take ideas from economic networks and apply it to biological systems or from social networks to apply it to economic systems and so on. Yeah, and I, I think uh, you know one example that comes to mind of what you were just talking about is when you think of, of the post um, financial crisis, people now have a term too connected to fail, right? It used to be too big to fail, but now it's too connected to fail. And it, it you know we have this idea that banks now have this property that there can be central individual banks that can bring down an economy if they were to fail. And, and so this kind of concept can be quite useful. And I think, it, you know, in, in your area, Victoria, this is something that's, that's so fundamental in terms of trying to prevent spreads of diseases. Could you say a little bit about how the network science is, is advancing um, our, our ability to combat diseases like the ones we've just 
experience? Yes, absolutely. This concept of the presence of hubs actually has its relation uh, to, to a concept in, in, in epidemics that is really the, the presence of super spreaders. So those individuals who have the ability to spread to a large number of other individuals. So much more compared, let's say, to the average of the population. And we heard about that even during the COVID-19 epidemic, that there were some instances, some reports in the news, especially early on, of individuals who were during throughout their day infected a lot of other people, like 40 people even. Um, so part of this may be related to, to the disease itself, but part of, of this may be related also to the capacity of the individual, so immunological capacity of the individual to spread. But much of that is also related, and these are, there are studies, of course, are showing that very clearly also for SARS-CoV-2, much of that is related to the individual behavior. So the fact that the person had a lot of contacts throughout the day. So we go back to the concept of network, where this node had a lot of links throughout, for example, a certain period of time during which he was infectious. And that is the concept of hubs. So once a person of this type is infected, a large portion of the network then may be exposed to the infection, so may become infected very rapidly. This leads to a strong acceleration of the epidemic. This is a concept that is very, very important, especially in those networks where there is a large component of these viruses, a large component of these hubs, of sexually transmitted infections, for example, in certain networks, so for example, in um, MSM networks, uh, networks of men who have sex with men, yeah. are characterized by this probability distribution that have a long tail, meaning that there are few individuals, but those few individuals have really very large connections. And those are the ones who have the potential to spread. On the other hand, if we're able to identify them, so that is what both Laszlo and Duncan were saying, we can target them. We can target them with specific intervention, prevention strategies, and that is actually what's happening for many of the, of the diseases that we're talking about, for which, for example, specific treatment, preventive treatment are, uh, are provided to, to individuals who have, for example, this high activity in terms of interactions. Yeah, yeah, it, it, you know, in, in the political arena, networks appear in many different settings. Um, can you say a little bit about how networks have elucidated our understanding of, of political interactions? And, uh... Absolutely. Well, I think that um, the vast array of innovation in the um, study of politics using networks, whether they're looking at interest groups and how they could act, um, whether you're looking at political elites and their connectivity or um, the role of that interconnectivity among voters affects whether they vote, how they vote, um, and so on. Uh, my particular research uh, in recent years has focused on where, political, where people get political information from. Because we are, to be good citizens, you have to get political information. Um, and uh, that's clearly changed everywhere in the world in different ways. Um, we can think about how. Uh, it's changed how we get political information from friends. Certainly on Facebook, I've seen opinions from friends I never would have seen before. Um, I, um, uh, it changes where you get information, um, whether it's um, from mainstream media uh, or, um, or more niche media. It's also then had feedback effects because people have shifted away from local sources of news, at least in the US, so that many of those local sources of news have gone away. So, you know, you conceive of this as like people versus sources of information, and there's a there's important ways that those that that, that network has been rewired over the last 20 years it has been very consequential uh, for democracy and, and perhaps not always uh, in positive ways. Kathleen, I, um, one thing that you are, have been studying is not just a single network at a time, but interacting with different kinds of networks. And can you say a little bit about how taking different levels or, or interaction, multi-layered um, networks into account uh, helps us understand organizations and, and how humans behave. So when we look at both, not only who does who do who knows who and who is doing what, but also who is doing what with whom, who knows what, and how that knowledge you know is affected related to the things you do, you can begin to understand that there, you can actually predict that there are caps on organizational performance that can only be overcome by changing the way the organization is structured. That people's ability to be promoted depends on where they sit in that ecology of networks. 
Um, it also affects the diffusion of information. Um, to the extent we know that in social media, that the world is organized with these topic, informal organizations or topic groups that are connected at, at all these levels. And <clears throat> you can actually, by using network interventions, make those groups, turn those groups into echo chambers. And if you do that, you can actually polarize groups and you can actually lead to offline behaviors like protests. At the same time, by strengthening network interventions at both the social level and the knowledge and at the who knows what the knowledge level, you can actually make communities more resilient in the face of these changes. Disinformation, hate speech, and things like that. So one thing I'd, I'd like to turn to a little bit now is it, part of our, our task here is to look forward and see where network science is going and, and what kinds of things it might elucidate. And let me just start with one example and, and then you know open it up to people's discussion of what kinds of areas they see new information uh, emerging. And one example that we see in economics is you know people are more attuned to supply chains now. Supply chain disruptions at, at post COVID have, have we realize that these things actually matter. Um, there's companies now that are mapping out supply chains and actually able to map them out quite deeply. And for years there have been forced labor laws. So there's a law in, in Europe, there's one in the US, that you, if, if you're a company, you're liable if you source any um, products that were built with forced labor. So those laws have been very hard to enforce because it's very difficult to know where a company got its things from. But now with the new network information that's emerging and the data that's emerging, companies can actually track like five or six deep where their products are coming from and they can see whether or not they're actually indirectly getting forced labor and, and you know, countries can start tracking this as, as well. So that's an area where we could see fundamental differences in, in policies and in our ability to understand supply chains from new data. Um, are there other areas that people are, are you know, seeing emerging where um, network science looks poised to, to advance our ability to attack you know, problems or um, understand things that we haven't understood understood before. So I'll just sort of open it up if anybody has an example or, or something that they think is sort of exciting and something that we we, you know, we should be looking I think we've forward told to. you many yeah. examples, okay. right? <laughs> so the question is where do you start, right? I mean, let me just throw up one, right? Uh, we all know that the brain is a network. Until three years ago or four or five years ago, maybe, we never had a map. So, you know, the very first Nobel Prize in biology went to Ramon Hayal, uh, who, to kind of, who kind of showed the first microscopic images that we had individual neurons, and sometimes they connect to each other. But until about five years ago, brain science has a, had no tools to really map out how these neurons look like and how they connect to each other. That has drastically changed uh, recently, thanks to the emergence of the Connectome project which has started to give us first for small organisms and eventually would provide for humans as well fully neural level maps. It's something that we don't want to volunteer for because you have to slice the brain into uh, half micron slices to actually <laughs> get those. But those maps will eventually emerge. And what a wealth of data will emerge finally to understand how the brain works. Our typical network and yet we have no clue. So I, for example, expect that, net, that neuroscience will benefit a huge uh, from, uh, from network principles. And many of the tools that emerge in these different disciplines with people around the table and around the room actually will come and play an important role of understanding how the brain works. This is really the moment where we first start starting to see those connections. So, and, and, and I think that the, the, really the limit is, is, is I, I can't even imagine where would that take us down the line of, uh, of and we see some of it already emerging, you know, just the, just the other day was in the news that somebody who was paralyzed, had a stroke now actually is able to talk mm -hmm. through a computer device and, and, and this is still all without really kind of mapping out the full set of connections. But once we have it, right, it will really raise lots of applications. It will also kind of raise very fundamental questions of how similar we are in our brain, right? Now, much of the dogma is that we learn and hence our brain is very, very different. But one of the big surprises of the Human Genome Project was that we are so much more similar than we ever talk to each other. 
And there's no way that our brain can be random either, right? Because there's no way you can build a functional brain without controlling very well of who is connected to whom in the system. So the mystery, where is the information that encodes how the brain is being wired when you, all you pass is the genome to the child, right? And, and how deterministic of that process, how similar we are in the way our brain is wired, and what does that mean to ability to learn, to liberty to understand, to evolve, and, and in general, to kind of our sense of, of, of being a human. I'll jump to society, so, so if we're going from neural to societal uh, networks, um, really thinking about, I mean, really how, say, the internet platforms have rewired uh, where we get information from and political discourse in ways that are quite different from how they existed in years prior, right? Like, like the very fact, let's say on Facebook, I say something, it's not like I'm saying something to Duncan, I'm throwing it out there, and then Facebook decides, Hmm. Actually, that's no one's going to be interested in that, um, and so we're not going to show it to anyone. And so there's this kind of restructuring of political discourse by, you know, by different kinds of of platforms that mediate communication, even interpersonal communication. Like if we imagine, um, if we imagine that AT and T or the U.S. or phone the phone system said, you know, you know forty years ago. You don't really want to talk to your mother today, so we're we're actually going to block that call. Like the notion that that would be a, a, that kind of intervention would be wired into the systems would have been laughable, and yet that's actually pretty routine, even down to our email. That uh, that um, that uh, you know, Gmail systematically sends at every email I get from nature uh, into a spam. For some reason, um, and um, uh, which which has caused some awkward moments, um, and um, and and you know, so, and and so you can think about platform from platform and the choices we make, but then how that, um, that there's an emergent process by which uh, there's an interplay between our social networks and the algorithms which drives what we see, and I think that there, there's enormous promise for uh, studying that in ways to think about what's good for society, what's bad for society. I also think um, there are enormous prospects. It's really important to hold powerful institutions like Google or Facebook or other companies accountable for those kinds of engine, social engineering they're doing. And so there, there's an important role for network science to, to, um, to helping us understand what those, uh, what, what those interventions in our social networks are doing to us collectively. If I could just jump in on that, I can say that, um, you know, technology, as it often does, is playing sort of two roles here. One is uh, the one that, you know, David was focusing on, where in, in some sense the the technology is is rewiring the networks. It's having an impact on the networks that we live in and changing, you know, our experience of, of reality. But it also is having this other effect of uh, instrumenting the networks that we live in. And that has been a tremendous driver network science over the last 25 years. You know, if you go back 25 years, uh, the amount of data that was available was, was you know, uh, minuscule. It was very difficult to collect uh, network data for, um, you know, populations larger than, uh, you know, 100 people. And now we have, you know, billions of people in these, in these networks. So, um, so I think, you know, that, you know, there's sort of this love-hate relationship that we have with technology where on the one hand it has you know, provided us with, uh, you know, a tremendous driver of, of, the, of the scientific enterprise through the, the data that has been generated through, you know, billions of people using digital platforms. Um, but, you know, as David is mentioning, it also is having this uh, sort of, you know, hard to uh, uh, observe effect on, on, uh, uh, on, on future interactions. And, you know, increasingly we're starting to wonder whether that's, you know, always or even mostly a good thing. And I would say that it's even getting crazier, right? Because it's not just these two effects, it's also the fact that technology will now become a member of your networks. <clears throat> so, I mean, you're all used to saying, Alexa, do this, do that. You know, giving Alexa a certain amount of control over our lives. Or having your email automatically answer things for you. Or maybe, you know, autom having automatic schedulers. But there's now been lab experiments that show that in many settings, people are willing 
to take orders from machines in teams. So you can have a team lead as a robot. Well, what kind of teams should we have this kind of technology in? That's something we need to figure out. The, you know, other examples are we have all these bots online that are working online along with people. All of our understanding about networks assumes that all the other nodes around us, if I'm a person, they're all people. What does it mean to have all these robots in there that can, they don't have to sleep, they can repeat things a million times, they can act faster. How does that fundamentally change the networks and the way we understand them? What new math is it going to, it's going to create the need for new math. It's a really exciting time, but there are these other way of thinking about technology in there. I guess one, one question, let me just, just follow up on this thread a little bit. The, um, these algorithms are allowing us to do, they, they sort of amplify human abilities. So on one hand, we can be connected with more people, we can get information from more people, we can see things that David was trying to say to Duncan. Um, but at the same time, they're engineering things in ways that we we're not sure of. And they're also allowing us to select more. So, you know, there's this term homophily that comes out of sociology, which tends, you know, people tend to be associated with um, people who are similar to themselves. And Nicola Morlika illuminated that. Yeah, um, so th this is something where uh, we could be getting more connected, but yet more segregated at the same time in terms of the information that we're seeing, political echo chambers and so forth. Um, is there ways that we can make sure that the technology is used in good ways? Or you know, what do we learn from network science that might suggest what would be good uses of the technology and what might be potentially damaging uses? And how do we police this? Um, how do we make sure that the private enterprises that, that control these platforms are doing things in our favor? So any thoughts on sort of you know, where do we go given that this this is emerging, it's it's changing rapidly, and, and yet it's changing in ways that are somewhat anarchic right now. I think this is a great example of where um, it's important to, to first start with really good data um, because our intuition on these sorts of questions can be, can be misleading. Right? So it's sort of very easy to imagine circumstances under which, uh, you know, people will select uh, into you know like-minded communities and uh, uh, or be or be uh, directed there by some sort of algorithm that's you know optimizing for engagement or for outrage or something or is increasing polarization so we can you know we can tell these very uh, convincing stories that sound uh, alarming about the you know the emergence of filter bubbles and echo chambers and everything online but the empirical evidence is almost always more complicated than that, and it turns out that there's some of that happening, but there's also a lot of, of you know, diverse, uh, there can also be a lot of diverse consumption of information. And so, you know, I think, uh, you know, it's not that we shouldn't worry about these kinds of questions, but that, uh, you know, the answer, uh, the, the state of the world is almost always more complicated and multifaceted and heterogeneous than our intuition uh, and our intuitive models of the world allow for. And so I think, you know, the first step is to start with like really good descriptions of the world um, and, you know, from there, you know, decide what are the big problems to be solved. And, you know, one, one example that comes up often in, in my own work is um, uh, that, uh, you know, if you compare the consumption of news online to the consumption of news on television, it turns out that television is actually a much bigger problem when it comes to people selecting into, uh, into uh, you know, homogeneous communities than, than online. And this was sort of, um, you know, not something that people were necessarily focused on because we were, we were sort of convinced that algorithms were a problem. So I think, um, you know, again, sort of the, the, the question of, of data uh, should really be, uh, you know, uh, you know, as much as we have data now that we didn't used to have, and that's been very exciting, uh, in most cases, we don't yet have good enough data to answer many of the questions that we care about the most. And so, sort of in a forward-looking manner, I think that has to be uh, you know, a, a big uh, priority for us in terms of, you know, the next generation of network science. Mm -hmm. And if I could just build on top of that, and I 100% agree with the need for data and the world may be going in the opposite direction when we have inferior data uh, going forward in certain kinds of ways. Um, but the other thing is, I think um, 
a lot of the interventions we might think of may actually be counterproductive. And again, this goes to like really needing, needing not just to go with naive intuitions, but to rigorously test uh, certain kinds of intuitions because there have actually been many examples of, well, let's let's connect people on Twitter. There's a great paper by Chris Bale and others that looked at like creating uh, people, making happy people follow a Confederate account that exposed them to counter attitudinal uh, content. And it actually drove, it polarized people, um, and uh, which wasn't, I don't think that was a hypothesis to begin with. And so, uh, and I can think of other research along those lines. On the other hand, uh, my collaborators and I, we, um, I think there is a lot of promise. We did work where we connected people to their members of Congress in online town halls. It was a full scale RCT. Uh, and it turned out um, that actually you know, technology offers a way to take you know, politics, even from counter uh, uh, constructive, if counter attitudinal politics, into people's kitchens, into people's living rooms, where it's a lot cheaper uh, to go than have people go to some town hall. And you get more diverse people um, interacting and connecting with the political system in ways that was actually quite positive for uh, a whole bunch of uh, political measures. And so I think there, the technology actually offers a whole bunch of ways to connect that might be extremely constructive. Uh, but actually, also a lot of the kinds of interventions that have been tried uh, have, when they've been rigorously evaluated, have actually been counterproductive. So they're, 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 we need the descriptive data, but then I think for proposed interventions, we actually need rigorous uh, tests. So I think you have to go way beyond data, though, because in this area, a lot of your solutions are things that require uh, interventions that are, occur at the technology level, the legal level, the educational level, all together. And in part that's because a network process or a network position always has both a good side and a bad side, right? So like I can look at someone in an organization say, oh, they're really highly connected and they're connected not just to a lot of people, but they have access to all these resources and all this other stuff. And so from a corporate perspective, I'd look at that person and say, they are so overworked, I've got to support them or they're going to leave my company. But if I'm an adversarial company, I could say, that's the person I'm going to go to to steal secrets from that company. So again, good and bad side. You know, similarly, I can build a bot that uses network affordances to market something and so get, get the latest drugs out for solving some disease out to whoever needs them so they at least hear about it. But I can, and I can use that exact same one to recruit kids into a terror organization. And I can use the exact same technology and the same, uh, the same network structure to warn people that tsunamis are coming. So I think part of it is endemic on us to always think about the good side and the bad side of the same process at the, at the same time and to think more broadly about how these things work. And I guess, you know, when, to relate to Victoria a little bit, yeah. when, when you think of good and bad sides to human networks, you know, globalization has been amazing in, in many ways. Travel, um, the world is much smaller than it used to be for <coughs> interacting. And maybe we've been lucky for a hundred years where we didn't have a major pandemic and then we hit one. Um, how do we balance the fact that we you know, humans like to, to travel, humans like to move around, we, we really have this need to, to be interactive, but at the same time, we're opening ourselves to potential um, pandemics. Is, is there ways that network science can help and inform us on what the trade-offs are or, or how to protect ourselves at the same time as, as having a more integrated society? Well, I'm sure network science allowed us to understand, uh, let's say, the mechanism behind this rapid spread worldwide. And we always think about the fact that traffic has largely increased over the last, for example, decade. And this is true, but the, the, the fundamental uh, element that really explains this rapid spread once there is an epidemic that is not contained at the source is more really the structural organization of the traffic across the world. And here, for example, I'm talking about air travel connections, so I'm, tra I'm talking about uh, travel flows between two different airports, uh, and not only the, the traffic flow has increased itself, but also the number of connections have increased. And this makes, uh, uh, makes our trips so much, much easier. Here we have uh, people coming from other continents, and I'm sure that, of course, for them it was kind of easy to arrive here because there is a, a short number of jumps that is needed to reach your destination, wherever you're studying from. But on the other hand, 
uh, that makes it also easy for, for a virus to spread when it is carried clearly by, by an infected person. So this is what we learned. And actually, you, you, know, you can develop theories and show that it is really the presence of hubs. Hubs is a term that is, uh, that is borrowed, originally borrowed from transportation theory. And if we think about hubs, we think about airport hubs, so they have a large number of connections. And again, we go back to, the, to that concept. The very same presence of these airport hubs is the reason why it is really hard to contain an epidemic at the source so once it, it emerges. Of course, there are other elements to it, which is that once you deal with, with the real epidemic, then you need to deal with, uh, well, first of all, being able to recognize it. So having a good surveillance system in order to recognize that something new, for example, emerges. And then you have to alert, of course, uh, uh, authorities in order to also alert internationally what's what's happening and that there is always a delay in all those processes and so the fact that there are delays in recognizing there is an epidemic and authority and surveillance allow them in many many cases to the virus to spread this is what happened for example to the, at the start of, uh, of the SARS epidemic and if I may, on, on that, I mean, it's maybe a good moment for us to step back and celebrate this moment of what happened with the COVID and with, with the role of network science in there, right? Because, you know, around 2000 was the moment when many scientists and network science community in Tour de Vitoria have recognized how important role networks play, contact networks, uh, uh, travel networks in the system. And the response of the community was to develop very accurate predictive tools that were ready to go when the pandemic hit. So, so we tend to think that the pandemic was the moment when suddenly everybody got together and developed these tools. The reality is years before that, thanks to Victoria's and other people's work, there was a functioning predictive system of how the disease would spread. And I can tell you from my personal experience, right, <coughs> in 2019, December, in our institute, it was a daily discussion about what COVID will do for us. And, uh, and already in January, we were very, very clear that this will have major consequences. In February, we kind of saw, so, not thanks to the work of Vespignani and others, that there, there has to be a lockdown because there's no other answer, given the way the disease is spreading. So what's the big picture? By the time the pandemic has arrived, Network science has provided a set of tools that were fully predictive and were able to foresee what are the consequences of what happened. So there was no surprise that when actually finally the decision makers recognized the, the gravity of the situation, then they made Alessandro Vespignani to be the White House modeler, they made Victoria to be involved in the French report, they made Dirk Brockman to be kind of talking regularly to Angela Merkel and many other decision makers because suddenly there was a wealth of knowledge and tools in the network community that could be acted on. And one day we should tell the story, and I think a little bit on you, I don't know if Victoria, you have a sense of how many lives were saved in the long run. Probably that's a longer story to be told, thanks to these tools that have emerged and have offered mechanisms for intervention. Do we have a sense of that? So I'm not going to say any number here. Clearly <laughs> <laughs> not. But Let's say, linking to that and to your like, previous last question about you know, what is the future. And I was going to say that uh, natural science in the field of infectious disease epidemiology, I think it, it already proved that it is a success story. And, and clearly everybody knows about COVID-19 pandemic, but I can trace it back and there are several other instances of outbreak yeah. response that we worked on in which uh, network was really very important when thinking about Ebola outbreak, or thinking about MERS outbreak, thinking about Zika. So, so there are so many, many examples in, in the recent past. What is next uh, there is somehow to combine everything that has been said here in your future of organizational research, political science research, social science research, and embed that into epidemic models. Why is that? Because we always think about infectious diseases as something that is exclusively biological, right? And we have a pathogen and so, well, it's not that we study the pathogen and then we understand that. Well, this is not the case because clearly there is the, the, the social interactions of people is the fabric over which that pathogen will spread. And natural science allowed us to understand how and where epidemics spread, whether they, they why they spread in that population, they do not spread in the, that other population. And it is the same pathogen. 
So all of that to say that clearly the behavior is the essence of what we do and is extremely important. Now we have a very good characterization of behavior, let's say in normal time, but when it is, when it is challenged by outside events, when it is challenged by our fears, when it is challenged by our perception of the race. So all of that somehow make connections to everything that was said before. How it is challenged uh, somehow, how this behavior is shaped by our political <coughs> attitudes, given that we're talking about policy that provide that in, in implement restrictions. What is my adherence to those policies? So all of that clearly is, to me, is really the next step. So, so I see a lot of integration in, uh, in these many different disciplines. And it's important to keep in mind that it wasn't just a pandemic, it wasn't just a disease, right? It was also an infodemic. And for the first time, we had more disinformation going than in any event previously ever throughout the entire world. And it was global, faster, and more of it. And network science, again, was very important here, both in identifying the sources of the disinformation, tracking where it was going to, discovering that different kinds of disinformation were being used systematically in different kinds of communities. So for example, the disinformation I would send to a group of, say, people from the islands in the southern part of the US would be geared toward their culture and their views about how to be healthy because they were refusing to go to hospitals. And so the whole network science stuff was used here to help uh, public health people who didn't have enough resources to understand what kind of disinformation to counter where. Well, I, there were a couple of things about the, the pandemic that were sort of revelatory for me uh, from a network science perspective. The, the first um, was uh, that, and I think to say that a lot of the emphasis prior to COVID uh, was really in a, a sort of prevention mode that you're sort of imagining that there's a, a disease, a novel disease that's emerging in some part of the world. And the, you know, the focus of the modeling and the prediction is you, how do you kind of uh, avoid it spreading uh, you know, everywhere? But of course, you got to that point where in effect it was everywhere. It was in every town and every city in, in America and almost uh, everywhere in the world. Um, and then you have a very different set of questions, right? And the, the, the kind of policy decisions that you're making are no longer about you know shutting down airlines because it's already everywhere, right? Um, and you know much more at the sort of local level of municipalities uh, and cities where you know mayors have to make and local public health authorities have to make very difficult decisions about well do we shut down schools or do we shut down you know bars and restaurants or do we ask people to stay at home and um, and you know so they're grappling with uh, and they were I mean you know in, in my city of Philadelphia the public health department was grappling with these very difficult questions. Um, and they had no tools for how to think about this. And so I think, um, you know, again, that's a, 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 it's a different type of network science question. And we have new types of data that sort of emerged during the pandemic or the data were there before, but they became available to researchers during the pandemic that uh, rely on, on uh, uh, GPS locations from, from cell phones. Um, uh, that can potentially answer these sorts of questions, but very different types of questions than the questions that we were previously thinking about. Um, so that was the first big revelation. And the second one, of course, was that, you know, all epidemics are behavioral, as it turns out. Uh, and I don't think anybody's models uh, uh, anticipated that, you know, sort of a third of the country would simply refuse to get vaccinated even after vaccines became widely available. Uh, and that, I think, threw many people for a loop. Uh, that you, know, you, you cannot just think of the solution to these problems in, in pharmaceutical terms, that even if you, uh, you know, throw enormous resources at, uh, you know, at, at rapidly developing vaccines, which they did and was a, a really kind of a miracle of, of modern biotechnology, uh, you're, you're still only two thirds of the way there. Um, uh, and that, uh, I think, you know, presents us uh, with another whole set of very difficult questions that um, that you know we need to uh, that we need to grapple with going forward and just to uh, build off of that i think the part of why we saw so much of let's say in the u.s roughly a third or a little less uh, of the country not get vaccinated uh, um, really has to do with trust right and mm -hmm. trust ultimately is a network idea is the question of who do you trust who do you trust for what um, and ironically, so given 
context here around the scientists, that a lot of the issues that we saw, I think, in the U.S. and other countries, and I'll point people to a project I co-directed called the COVID States uh, Project, um, was really about a lack of trust in science and around a social distance of certain geographic areas, certain demographics from science. And those are the those were the sectors of society that said, you know, I don't really trust, you know, some some substance getting injected into me. That just seems inherently a risky thing to do, right? Uh, it takes a, it's not intuitively obvious that this is a healthy thing. Right. Uh, it requires a trust in the system, in uh, sort of the epistemology of science that somehow, you know, what, what's an RCT and so on. Well, of course, you don't need to know that, but you need to say, um, you know, you need to believe that there is a system out there that is evaluating the safety and the efficacy of this. And a large chunk of the world doesn't have that trust. And that, that's a thing for us. Uh, there's a... I don't know if on camera you can see this, but there's a whole bunch of scientists in the space, right? But like the question of the distance between us and our societies. And I think that has been, I think there is a big uh, distance and that is consequential uh, for our politics, it's consequential for individual decisions to make, uh, to make healthy decisions. And I think that's again another, it's another network thing because it is around, do I trust uh, science? Do I trust the information that I'm being provided? Thank you. Which is at the global level, <clears throat> a lot of the work has actually been showing that there's been concerted attempts by various actors, adversarial actors, to actually grow the networks of distrust in science, you know, over the past eight years. And that has led to, culminated at this time, in this lack of science. And they, and they then built connections using network techniques, built connections between the, both the anti-face mask people with the uh, anti-lockdown with the anti-vaccination people and so on, whereas it had been a much more nuanced discussion about vaccination prior to COVID, but it was all linked into this anti-science through these network techniques. But it's fair to say that despite of all of these kind of network effects that we saw, in the end, the pandemic was really a big test for network science, and, and it really kind of showed the power of the thinking of kind of improving public health and helping. And I, when I kind of think about the future, and I'm assuming we're still in the future discussion, I can see many other ways in which network thinking can actually significantly to include health. Uh, one of them is really understanding the, the connections within the molecules within our cells has, could be, will lead actually, and has already led to examples of new type of drugs and new type of treatments. At Harvard Medical School, we have a network medicine division with more than 200 researchers who are using network principles to design new drugs and to design new treatments. In the US, there are already treatments on the market and, and diagnostics that are based on networks. And this is just kind of at the very biological, fundamental pharmacopoeic level. But then if we start thinking about the massive amount of data that kind of the, the health system has kind of collected about us and about interactions and about the many effects, there is a revolution that happening right now in the way we kind of get evidence-based, network-based approaches to really understand what works and what doesn't and for whom. And this is the way to kind of get to the idea of personalized medicine that is very much in the air, right, is that I, I'm, when I'm a patient, I have so many different network effects that are affecting me from my previous history, my connections, and so on. What is the right treatment for me? And you can only figure that out by understanding what is the environment, in my mind, what is my history, and so on. And for the first time, the data is emerging for us to try to do that. And when that will actually kind of build into treatments and, and medical practices, I expect that there will be significant positive outcomes for health. Uh, so if I think, kind of think 50 years from now, you know, now we have cardiologists and dermatologists, I think most doctors will have to be a little bit networkologists because they will have to understand many, the many types of networks that affect our health from the networks within our cells and the genes and the mutations all the way to the many social and economical and behavioral networks that all have an impact on the outcome. And I'm looking forward to that moment when the, when, when the doctor has this extra degree. Let me follow up a little bit on that. Uh, in, in terms of the, 
um, structure of networks and the importance of data that mm -hmm. has emerged in, in various forms here, right? From predicting um, uh, the, the potential transmission of diseases to understanding disinformation to understanding all the forces that are given on an, an individual. Um, data, we have more and more data that's being collected, it's, but it's being collected mostly by private enterprises, right? So these are companies that are, are collecting the data. Um, we don't, we have antiquated laws about who owns what data and, and who has the rights to it. It's, it's changed a bit in Europe, but um, not so much in the rest of the world. Uh, but it's very difficult for researchers to, to access now. And, and I guess one question going forward is, you know, what are the, what are the trade-offs between the public good of having really good data that we can begin to use to answer all of these important questions versus individual privacy concerns and corporate, um, you know, uh, in incentives and so forth. So how do we balance this? Where do we think that we need more data? Where do we need more access? Um, what, what are your thoughts on this, this, this kind of important aspect for network science to move forward? We really have to ha have access to these data sets. I, I see like sort of two, you know, main uh, alternatives. You know, the first one is to sort of try to work with the system that we have, which is the one you described where most of the data, which is expensive to collect, is being collected by private companies. Um, and to build, you know, you know, better, more transparent, more um, uh, open um, uh, and, and, you know, inclusive uh, forms of collaboration between uh, academic researchers and, and, you know, and private companies. And, and, you know, whether that's sort of uh, compelled through legislation uh, or, um, or elicited through some kind of, uh, you know, cooperative uh, arrangements, I think is, you know, all of these are different models that one could imagine. Um, but that would be sort of one approach, right, is to try to, to leverage the, the infrastructure that we already have. Um, but another one is to, um, is to, is either because the first one is impossible or unworkable or because, as we've been discussing, the data itself might be sort of, um, you know, uh, uh, irredeemably confounded by all of these sort of algorithmic uh, biases that are that are being uh, injected into it through through uh, uh, the, the platforms themselves, that we may decide that it's actually just not that useful for the kinds of research questions that we want to ask. In which case, we may have to invest you know public funds in building our own scientific infrastructure. And this is you know of course, something that, that we do in other fields, in physics and Genomics, large sums of money on, on building instruments and, and other types of infrastructure that uh, then benefit you know, thousands of researchers uh, used to answer big questions that are of interest to an entire community of, of, of scientists. Uh, and that's sort of traditionally not been a, a very prevalent model in the, in the social sciences, aside from some large surveys that, are, that, are, that, that we run. Um, uh, and would, be a much, would require a much larger investment uh, in social sciences than, than we currently have. Um, but I think, you know, if that's the, the road that we decide to go down, then I think, you know, it's on incumbent on us to make the case that, uh, that, uh, that the, the outcome will be of sufficient interest and importance that it's worth the investment. And so I think, you know, COVID is an interesting place to start, or, or, or you know, the sort of the next pandemic is an interesting place to start, because I think it's very clear to everyone <laughs> that that matters. Um, uh, and uh, so, you know, building our own infrastructure um, uh, would, you know, uh, would require some pretty big changes in how we think about doing science. But I think that's something we should be taking very seriously. I mean, even with that, I think that COVID nineteen pandemic was really a groundbreaking example, but to some extent, we're in, in two different directions for two different reasons. So, when you work on infectious disease modeling, you have you need two types of data. You need data that are infectious disease data, and then you need data which are mainly behavioral data. Now, infectious disease data up to COVID-19 pandemic, even that type of data was, let's say, could, could have been uh, difficult to access. Uh, access to privilege, for example, access was privileged, um, especially when you need, and you need, of course, for modeling for response, you need additional data, which is not exclusively the number of cases. Now, COVID-19 pandemic was 
what, what it did was that it completely broke down that, that privilege. Every country, given that everybody was facing that problem, every country had to organize on its own in order to build databases, to fill those databases, and then most of the time, at least in, in many countries in Europe, making those databases also publicly available. France and that had a fantastic surveillance system with very high granularity at tens of thousands of small areas of resolution for a country like France that's not that big compared to the United States, in which you had many, many information that were also stratified, for example, by age. But different countries behaved differently. What I meant with that is that once those data were publicly available, that somehow unlocked a scientific potential that was there in the community but that was not exploited simply because of that privileged access prior to that. So to me, that is really a revolution. And, and hopefully, for the next uh, truly epidemics and pandemics, we will not take a step back into that. Now, the other aspect uh, is probably what we are mostly thinking about when we think about data and difficulty to access data, which is, for example, behavioral data. And again, in terms of epidemics, I'll make a concrete example. Duncan mentioned that before, the use of cell phone data. Now, we use cell phone data in epidemic spreading even before COVID, mainly, for example, to understand spatial diffusion, like the disease is there and then it moves over there, what is the risk, etc. But there was a completely different use during, uh, throughout the pandemic, which was really using mobility data in order to understand the effect of social distancing. So in order to use this data to somehow infer through you know, quite sophisticated statistical models, uh, infer the reduction of your contact rates. So how much you reduce your interaction behavior with other people. And that was, a, again, a completely new use of, the, of those data. But for example, for us, it was possibly, it, possible exclusively because we had a, a prior collaboration with Orange, which is the main telephone company in France. And to give you an example of what it allowed us to do, we went into lockdown in, in March. And one month after, given that surveillance data was coming into play, we didn't know whether the curve was going down or not. So very practically, authorities, one month into lockdown, imagine 30 days into something that the world that your population never experienced before didn't know whether to say, yes, it's working, and soon after we'll be able to open, or no, it's not working, and we don't know what to do. And by the time we use this data in order to understand, uh, anticipate the decline that was not yet visible on, on the surveillance. So that was the first uh, use, uh, worldwide use of data for that approach. Now it's become mainstream, but again, our ability to be using that in the next response uh, is, is strongly compromised by the fact that these data are owned by private companies. And so we depend on their um, willingness to continue this type of collaboration. So, so I just want to jump in on, on a few points here. One is, um, is the need to build some type of ongoing capacity to study all of these things. In some places, there may be a bit more willingness uh, by companies, like if we're talking about the spread of disease, it, it's still uh, up to their goodwill, but they're actually, the notion of, let's say, Meta being involved in, in halting the spread of disease uh, is a good look. Um, on the other hand, studying the impact of Facebook on um, political discourse is a, is a, is a dicier thing uh, for them. And I do think that with the Digital Services Act in, in you, that possibility um, of, of really forcing companies to somehow make data available while still preserving the privacy of people in the data, which is a tough trick. Um, um, the second thing, uh, and this is, was Duncan's last point, but I want to give a particular example, is to build some ongoing uh, social science informed infrastructure. And this is I'm leading a project called the National Internet Observatory that's supported by uh, a large uh, $16 million grant. The objective there is to build this ongoing data collection on where people get information from and get a large set of volunteers so we can understand the, the role of technology and connectivity, but that has to be a long, that has to be a long play. Um, um, that has to be many years, many thousands of researchers ultimately uh, using it. The other source of data I do also want to highlight that hasn't been mentioned is government data. 
and this is something in Sweden is a big deal, and actually in, in Scandinavia in general, it's, a, it's pretty extraordinary, the science that is possible here, uh, that is not really possible so much uh, in the U.S. And I do think, uh, although I can think of examples in the U.S. as well, but in very, the, the examples are like really the exceptions to the rule, like Raj Chetty's uh, move to opportunity uh, research really involved having to connect uh, IRS data over decades to particular people who participated in a particular experiment. That was extraordinary. But, but gosh, that does not happen very often in the U.S. Uh, but like the question is, is there a way to build models to facilitate more research given the data, given that the government has uh, the, the responsibility to, for public good? Is there a way of building more models uh, to facilitate that beyond Scandinavia. Um, and, uh, and I think that would, um, I mean, I, I think there are models developing, but we need to do more of that. And so I, I, think, um, I think that there is a tremendous amount of public good that has to be done, it has to be done in these spaces. Accountability of really private, uh, powerful actors uh, that would prefer not to be accountable. I mean, I appreciate that why they wouldn't want to be accountable, but like there is a dramatic need for, for more and for policies that support that. So. I wanted to add that um, in order to track disinformation during COVID, one, you know, people were using social media data. And this is multi universities throughout the world were doing this. And the amount of data that was collected from Twitter, Reddit, and all these other platforms was unbelievable. And if you were to collect that same amount of data now, it would count, it would cost you somewhere over, you know, $100 million for one year's worth of data. And we have two and a half years. So it's, it's, you know, it's just not possible. The other thing I would point out when I make is that it's not just disease. There's many other areas where the data issue is actually, um, has been made prevalent and made it made issue to network science. And that is um, in the area of tracking covert networks, tracking criminal networks. Our theft is a global phenomenon and network data. Um, it's difficult to get the data and share it between countries. And so it's very hard to deal with that. Uh, deal with that. Many things having to do with governance across countries, again, is very hard. Any kind of natural disaster that occurs, like on the borders, I mean, think about your bridge, right? Something happens between Denmark and Sweden, it's going to be very hard to share data, okay? It's even worse when it's U.S. and Canada, you know? <laughs> it's going to be very hard to get that. But the other, fun, the final point I want to make is that it's not just about getting access to data. I mean, any data we get is never going to be perfect. There's going to be missing data, it's going to be a sample, there's going to be biases in the data. And an important thing for us as scientists to think about is what are the new algorithms, techniques, what is the new science we need to make sense of biased data so that we can do network science and make it more robust, even in the face of missing data and things like that. That's certainly a very tough problem. Yeah. <laughs> and one that's sort of been the elephant in the room in network science for a long time as we, we look at the data that we have and, and extrapolate from that. But, but we're getting better. We're getting a bit better, yes, definitely. Well, the way I always tell my students that if you wait for the data to be complete, you will miss all the discoveries to be made. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yes. And you might die before the complete. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, okay, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. So, so um, I guess, yeah, we can open things up to questions from the audience. Are there things that, that people want? Uh, I, I have uh, a question. Brian. Uh, so, I've got kind of a practical question. Uh, first of all, thanks to everybody. It's been a great discussion. And you've made a fantastic argument about the importance of networks in their lives, both the good and the bad aspects of networks. But for people in the audience and people out online, what would be your recommendation for building a better network? So if I'm sitting here listening to you, how would I know if I've got that good network or the bad network? And what could I do to strengthen my network to get the most out of it? I would imagine that all of you have fantastic networks. You probably wouldn't be in the position you're in. <laughs> <laughs> so I think everybody would love to hear your advice about can I can I take the first? So we have to, so that's a very very good question, and uh, and and we have to be a little careful of when do we when can we afford to build a network? Yeah, sorry, right? sorry. We, we have to repeat the question. And sure. That didn't, so so, didn't so like that. how what would be the optimum the good network and how could we build better networks? Mm -hmm. right? And uh, and and you know I just as a note of caution I would like to kind of mention some line of research that happened in network science kind of early on where 
you know, many colleagues, rightly so, looked at the power grid that back then when the power grid data was available and made, made recommendations how rewiring one to five percent of the links would make the power grid a much more stable network, meaning that less prone to breakdowns, uh, less outage, and so on. And it's a perfectly valid research, except that you cannot rewire a power grid, right? In the sense that getting just one new line in the power grid is typically a 25-year process because you have to buy the land, <laughs> because you know, typically you have to appropriate the land from the people, and, and the process is, is, is exposed. So, so I often think that many of these networks were handed to us, that they are structurally so ingrained that we don't have an option to redesign it. If we would have been given to start from scratch and design a new internet, we could probably make a much better internet than we have right now, but we don't have a chance. So, so I guess then the question probably you referred to, what are the networks for which we have that freedom? Yes, so and right. how do we approach that, right? Handshake to handshake. handshake. What should I be doing to build a better network? Good, so, so says I'll the guy from the business school. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, so social networking, how do we build a better network? Um, let me say one thing, I think, uh, you know, part of the interest in networks is that they have these amplifying effects and feedback effects, mm -hmm. and that makes social engineering very dangerous, right? So we start to rewire part of the network and it can have unintended consequences in other parts. Mm -hmm. And we've seen that in our Indian data where we you know, went into villages and you get people loans and people who get loans end up somewhat better off financially, but other people are losing parts of their mm -hmm. network as a result of this. So it's, it's very tricky. Social engineering could be a really dangerous thing, and it's not easy. So there's individual questions about how do we build our, ourselves a better network, but mm -hmm. you know, trying to engineer networks can be quite, quite tricky. And I guess that gets, you know, there's all kinds of questions about our algorithms and how they're impacting the world. The thing I'd say in response to that is just that we engineer networks all the time, whether we need to or not, right? We have, um, you know, at faculty meetings where we don't have faculty meetings, we have spaces where we can gather, where we can't gather. Um, there are a lot of ways that we are always engineering our networks, whether as individuals, like coming to a conference is a way of engineering your personal network. Organizations do a little bit, right? A lot of what um, in, in the U.S., at least, there's a lot of push to bring people back to work because a lot of people have been working remotely and they've not been, they've not been enthusiastic about going back to uh, back to work. But it's been consequential. We've re, we've accidentally re-engineered our networks, or COVID re-engineered the networks for us over the last several years, right? Um, and so, uh, and and a lot of businesses are now like trying to say we lost something in the process, um, and. With, you know, which I, you know, personally see even with my own lab or at, at Northeastern, and so, um, so I, I, I actually don't have. I think in in a sense, the the answer is it depends because it depends on the kinds of problems you're solving. I've worked on the question of active problem solving uh, in networks, and the answer is I, you know, given a you know, a very well-defined problem. I could probably come up with a network that I can never engineer in the real life, in the real world. But there are definitely, there are definitely a lot of things, both macro, societally, where we put roads and, and, and uh, highways and trains that are extremely consequential. We, we're engineering those networks, uh, whether, whether we're doing it consciously or not. And so it is a thing that we, uh, I'm, I'm not answering your question, but I'm just saying that we can't just sort of take these things as, as uh, as given because like it's happening we're doing it we might as well do it thoughtfully rather than just let the powers that be say yeah that works for me i wonder if it's really engineering the network or just finding our position within that right because we let's realize that some of these networks are so massive and we have so little control individually on that and many of the examples we heard is really about how do you kind of re-engineer the local neighborhood of the network that, that you really belong to for a certain purpose and so I think when we think about these massive networks that span continents and, and many aspects of our life, we really have control about a small piece of that. And, and, and I think that is also very valuable to ask, how do I find my position within the network? Should we call that engineering? Sure, engineering from my perspective. But, but that's kind of the first, that's the most accessible part for us. So a few years ago, we had the opportunity 
working with this one organization to actually design its or to design its structure. And um, so there were a couple of teams of us. And one approach was I'm going to design the optimal, most efficient network structure possible. So everything works well, everything gets as fast as possible, no redundancy, et cetera. My approach was a little different. I said, I've got to do this a learning organ learning organization. Well, they liked the idea of optimal and efficient, which was fine until the first thing went wrong. Because as soon as something went wrong, whether it was someone going out because they had the flu or they were hired away, the entire organization fell apart. Because they had designed a way by making it so efficient. They had done, designed a way the redundancy that made it resilient. So a key here is making organizations resilient. From an individual perspective, um, one of the things that is not afforded to us by a lot of the tools and technologies we have is the ability to monitor and watch our own networks. We often can tell who my friends are, but we don't see who our friends are connected to. And to the extent you can actually help people see their own ego network, even if it's just one level out, see who their friends are, see who their friends' friends are, and whether those people are connected, you can actually help them build resilient networks, especially once you've taught them what resilience is. And they're trying this approach with children who have autism and their parents. And by helping them understand what the networks are, the parents are able to do better interventions to help the children. So an answer to thing is help people to learn what, how to make their own networks resilient for the tasks they want to do. John? Um, yeah, thanks for all the interesting. Uh, one of the things, obviously, was sort of all your thoughts on the kind of future directions where ways networks can be applied. I, I was thinking about, you know, there are a lot of directions which are sort of, let's say, adjacent to applications currently being done or sort of, you know, where things are emerging. But one of the striking things about the study of networks is these sort of repeated surprises where you take data and you sort of look later and say, oh, I never realized you could think about this as a network. It just wasn't even on my radar. So I'm wondering if you were to look further out in emerging directions, are there places where people are just literally not thinking of things as networks where it might become productive to apply it, and, you know, as opposed to the, the sort of adjacent areas where we sort of see it coming? Yeah. So just to make sure everybody hears, um, so the question is really, are there, are there areas where networks are actually present but people don't think of it or we haven't really been thinking of it and looking at it as a network problem yet yeah. where we, we could see advances? So thoughts on that? And I can start with one. I think you know, international conflict is an area that, that people have realized that countries are, are interconnected. But the sanctions system that is being put in place is actually a network problem. And you know, getting some countries to, to impose sanctions and other ones not, and trade reflows and redirects itself in ways that we really don't understand yet. That seems to be a problem that you know, international conflict is now, a, a lot of the pressure that's put on is not necessarily troops, but hopefully um, sanctions and indirect pressures. And we don't necessarily understand how that works yet and, and where the leaks are and how effective it's going to be. Our, our projections are very um, inefficient. And, and it's, it's such a, it could be such a useful tool if we better understood sanctions. So that's one example, I think, where, where we, we have a good Cooperation is also important when you have an economic level. I mean, it's a global problem, but it's never been addressed in such a way with a global perspective. Uh, so there are, for example, uh, treaties or that regulate uh, um, uh, some of some of the, uh, for example, some of the intervention that can be put in place at the international level, uh, but they're not um, mandatory. So they're not binding, and we have seen with COVID that the heterogeneity of the countries having a way before what the others didn't have it. For example, some countries didn't have big. Uh, large incidents during the first summer and so they were trying to attract uh, other other uh, citizens and tourists for the summer season but truly that brings that uh, you move infections from one area to the other you actually facilitate the spread so that cooperation international cooperation is actually extremely important and is even more important at the start of the outbreak because if there is any chance to really contain it that is where cooperation becomes important so another area even though I think many of us say, well, obviously there's networks there, uh, but in law enforcement, many law in many cities, 
The law enforcement people do not think of what they're doing as having anything to do with networks whatsoever. The best ones do, but a lot of them, average cities don't. And getting them to think about um, networks is very, is very critical and would actually help them think more strategically, particularly in areas dealing with things like human trafficking or drugs or whatever. Um, another, another area is uh, software design. Uh, any, you know, if you have a set of, now you know, a lot of software is open source, it's all interconnected parts, but you know, people don't look at it as a network. When you start to, you can see points of failure where things can fall apart. And I know one bank that did this, and they probably, they said they saved millions by just simply understanding where in their software, if they made a change and it went down, it would affect what other parts of the organization. So software is, software is another particular issue. And, and the thing I, the idea I'd put out there, and I, others have put this out there, but I think it's very incipient, is the notion of thinking of human lives as trajectories through time and space that are intersecting. And obviously, this matters a lot for epidemiology, but also matters a lot sociologically and how people connect in the city, occur, connect across uh, places, um, what, what's happening in those points of connection, whether there are conversations or ideas transpiring. and, and the notion of reconceiving um, uh, networks as really trajectories of points of intersection, facilitating, and I'm taking, for example, John, John Paget's work on, on Florence, but like for, for facilitating recombination of things and so on is, is something that I think um, whole, it's a very different metaphor for what net networks are, but I think has potential power. John, would you? <clears throat> um, the topic of the Session, of course, is the future of networks, of network science. Uh, everyone is more or less optimistic, but I wanted to raise a concern, a red flag, about the future of network science. And uh, the red flag has to do with the fact that as the field drifts more and more and more to the study of the internet, you know, you get more and more and more about less and less and less. You know, the, the, the content of what's going on gets sort of left behind by Berkeley's enthusiasm about the overall I'm motivated in part because I have one <clears throat> foot in history, which is not here, you know, but uh, history, surprisingly, is, is also totally interested in this concept of networks, and, you know, they talk about networks and networks, but, of course, their way of doing it is this deep reading of, of letters and so forth, they get deep into the guts of what actually is being talked about and so forth, and they're not so good on the big picture, but they're much better than we are in terms of the content of what's actually happening uh, in these networks. And, you know, if, if we potentially have some tools, you know, some networks might be helpful to, to get ourselves uh, back on the track. But in, in, in general, the, the field is just moving uh, very, very far away from the content of what's happening uh, in these networks. And that's a concern of mine. You know, I think uh, we ought to bring somehow this more linguistic, uh, cultural, um, type of anthropological type of approach to networks more into this room. You know, we should have more of those people here, not just uh, the computer science crowd. Yeah, so let me just repeat this so people can hear that the, the, the point was being made, the point and question of how do we keep um, network science on track when it, it can be distracted a bit by internet and other data, which has become ubiquitous, but isn't necessarily fully reflective of, of life. And there's other techniques coming from linguistics and anthropology and other areas. Um, and I, obviously, we've, we've got you know a, a limited you know, already six people from six different disciplines up, up here. We could add more. If you'd have a you know twelve or, or fourteen. Um, but it is important, and I guess if people have comments on this. I would just say that it, it, I think there's too little qualitative work uh, that's interwoven with the quantitative. Um, you know, my dissertation involved both doing surveys of networks, but also uh, observant participation, so I could understand. Oh, that's the pressures. That's why they. That's the rhythm of the organization. That's the logic of what people are, are talking about. And I do think that, in part, due to the you know, deeper sociological divides within the academy that there isn't a lot of qualitative, quantitative kind of uh, collaboration, which would get part get that depth and breadth. Uh, and, but there are definitely, there's definitely ethnographic and there's definitely qualitative work going on. It's just actually not been well connected and well integrated into the 
um, into the more quantitative, mega quantitative uh, research. I, I, I agree wholeheartedly, and I think that's sort of a direction the field really needs to invest in the social network. I'm sorry, I disagree. <laughs> <laughs> I disagree in part because our, that's exactly what our center does all the time, okay. is we bring in the social network along with the semantic network, use NLP, uh, natural language processing tools, in addition with machine learning and digital network science tools in order to look at not just who is saying, who's talking to whom on the internet, but what is it they're saying and how, is, how does what they're saying influence the formation of new groups and new groups and so on. And what, you know, and, and I would say the semantic part is relatively straightforward. It's harder to get at the emotions, although we can now begin to get at those, even because a lot of fabulous work that's been done in cognitive science recently, using uh, linguistic cues and so on. Uh, but getting it into images, and our next big challenge will be pulling the data out of images and video and audio as well. But you know, currently, most of what we know about how people form stances and have changed their attitudes to climate change, their attitude toward disinformation, has been precisely because the content was looked at as well as the social network. I was actually going to uh, say an answer to John's question about like where are where are sort of areas where we, if we don't sort of think of as networks that, that could be thought of as networks. I would say the the media, the mainstream media, not social media, but the mainstream media is a, is an example of uh, of of, uh, of a network phenomenon that we don't really think of as a network phenomenon. So the linkages there are, are not um, uh, social; they are semantic, right? That if you can look at the text. Uh, of, um, uh, of you know what uh, of the stories that uh, you know hundreds of thousands of, of publications put out on a daily basis, uh, you can uh, you can identify um, uh, uh, the, the linkages between them, uh, and you know if there are some sort of interesting surprises in there where it turns out that there are um, uh, a large number of articles that are actually identical, um, and it turns out they're identical because all of these. Uh, seemingly local publications are in fact just different skins on the same underlying you know content management system and so you can extract these these networks of of, uh, of, of publishers that are that look like local newspapers but are in fact uh, these sort of centrally controlled organizations um, and then you can weaken the, the similarity below identity and you can go down to things that are that are um, you know different versions of wire uh, articles and you can go down to things that are just on the same topic and you identify events and so there's a lot you can do uh, uh, with text data um, that is in effect a network problem without the network ever being sort of explicitly articulated in the, in the way that we might sort of naively think. Yeah and using network techniques we found these sites Robert referred to as pink slime sites you know and they're actually there's six major organizations that link almost all of them together. And you know they're very, very prevalent in America, but there's an equivalent system that's been developed um, in things like Telegram that has actually been very important in the Ukrainian war. But I, I do think what we're missing is sort of like the street corner society integrated with the big end kind of analysis. And I, 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 do, I, I will hold by that. I agree with you that there's a lot of interpretive work that is going on with some of the textual stuff or there is a lot of NLP stuff methods built on top of that but people are like in the, in the social processes participating in the social process because you can't really go back to the Medici either so there's a way in which uh, you, there, there's a limit to what what can be done historically versus like what could be done in sitting on a street corner uh, in a city and seeing what's happening but I do think that there is a lack of that Deep qualitative work coupled with um, with the with the more bigger N, and I'm an advocate of the bigger N statistical stuff. So don't get me wrong, but I actually think there's a lot to be done on the deeper qualitative side. I think we we're at time, so we we have to wrap things up. But I want to thank all of the panelists and, and our uh, audience. It's been a, a far-reaching discussion, and I think you know gives us a, a feeling both for the the and the challenges ahead that we face. So um, thank you very much, everybody. Thank you.
good little contract. It was a, it was a very constructive uh, spot. Uh, thanks, Tom. That was great. Very good. Very good. Very good. Uh, <laughs>